All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. Today we are going to begin our discussion of postmodernism. This will be a kind of a two-week discussion as we discuss postmodernism, um, what the theory of it is, what the ideas are behind it, and discuss postmodern poetry this week. And then next week we want to move on to postmodern fiction. And then we'll really continue. I mean, as you'll see, it's not exactly clear what postmodernism is, but among other things, it's a period of American literature or of world literature more general, uh, more generally, and it's not clear when that period ended. So we will be talking about postmodernism in one way or another for the rest of the semester as we move out of the concerns of the middle of the 20th century, that period we were in of late modernism, of realism, of what I call the existential mood. We're going to move out of that into a set of new concerns that come to dominate uh, at least the rest of the 20th century. And then in the last weeks of the course, we're going to look at 21st century literature, which is arguably in many ways an attempt to get out of postmodernism, uh, whatever postmodernism is, which will be the topic of today's lecture. So before I even go into that, so this will be a lecture on postmodernism and its ideas. Then the next lecture will be uh, on postmodern poetry. And then next week we'll talk about postmodern fiction. But before we even do that, I'd like to just say a few words about this idea of isms, of why is it that we, that sort of the, the history of literature, the history of the arts more broadly, is divided into these isms and what they, what do they tell us about the world? And what are, what are the reasons to use them and what are some of their limitations? So what, how did these isms come about? I think isms came about because you don't hear about isms maybe uh, it, when you're talking about ancient literature. You don't hear about ancient Greek or Roman literature in terms of isms, or you don't hear about the literary periods that affect the texts of the Bible in terms of isms. They really come about in the modern period. And the reason that they come about, the idea that art you know, art is a series of these isms, modernism, realism, postmodernism, existentialism, all of these. How does that come about? I think it comes about in the modern period because one characteristic of the modern period starting about 500 years ago, I know this goes, of course, in contemporary American literature, but bear with me as we go back 500 years for a minute. One characteristic of the modern period is a pluralization of culture. Um, once you no longer have countries sort of ruled by state churches, for instance, that uh, that promote and pay for and organize the artistic productions of that country or culture, then artists are sort of free or condemned to the other authority of, uh, of serving other interests, whether that be the general public or private patrons or whatever the case may be. And so if, let's say you're a medieval artist and you are commissioned by the, uh, the, the church to design a cathedral, well, what you're going to do as an artist is going to be in many ways dictated by the ideology of the church. You're not really going to put your individual stamp on something. But if, you know, flash forward 400 years to, let's say, the 1700s or the 1800s, and there's no longer a, you know, state church to commission you to uh, do art. You're going to do art on your own, either to sell in an art market or to satisfy a private patron or whatever. Well, then you have a lot more of an ability to do what you want to do, sort of uh, irrespective of these governing strictures. But then that means you need an explanation of why you're doing it. You need a theory. You need to explain to yourself why you're making art this way and not in any number of the infinite possibilities of ways. So you need a theoretical program to justify why your art uh, looks this way, why your literature reads this way and not another way. Because with infinite possibilities comes the need for self-justification. Whereas before, in let's say the Middle Ages, 
the justification wasn't up to the artist because the artist wasn't free to define their own program. And so that is when art becomes in the last, you know, 500, 400, 300 years, this procession of isms starting really in the Renaissance at the end of the Renaissance with things like mannerism, etc. Um, so that's why we get these isms, because you have different groups of artists at different periods of time defining their art in particular ways according to different pluralistic programs because they're now in a culture where what art is and should do isn't dictated from above by the church or the government. So that's how it comes about that art becomes a matter of isms and why I'm always using these ism words. Now, there's a danger to using ism words, which is the following. The, it's the danger that comes with any generalization. Obviously, we need general generalizations to think. We can't be newly surprised at each new thing we encounter. We just the human mind works this way. We assign each new thing we encounter to some category. And I don't think we could function if we didn't. However, um, works of art, like individuals, uh, exceed any system that we could put them in. They're more complicated than that. They, uh, have, they have depths, they have nuances that can't be encompassed by a generalization. So the, fo the, 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 the folly, the danger of applying isms to works of art is that it leads us to override what is complex and interesting and singular and individual about them. And we don't want to do that. And no work of art is purely, well, no, let's say this, no good work of art is purely captured by the ism word we assign to it. And yet the isms help us think. It helps us to know what we're looking at when we look at a work of literature, if we say, well, that is realist. And realism was a type of literature that flourished at this particular time for this particular reasons for these particular reasons, and this particular work, such as, you know, Sonny's Blues, uh, fits the criteria of, of realism, and we can think about it in that way. But also knowing the ways in which certain works exceed the ism to which we might want to assign them because of certain superficial characteristics also helps us to understand what's, what's interesting about them. Just as we said, you know, roughly John Cheever's The Swimmer seems like a realistic story because it's um, about everyday life. It's, you know, doesn't defy necessarily the laws of physics. It, it attempts to capture a certain social reality, but it's also not realistic in that it takes place entirely in this delusional character's head, and we are never quite sure what's going on. We never receive all the facts. So it's at the boundary of realism. And knowing how a work both does and doesn't fit into any of these isms is always important, and I'll try to mark that as we go on. So of all the isms, um, postmodernism is perhaps the most controversial, the most famous, the, the one that people often talk about. It's a word that's often thrown around, even in contexts far from the arts. You know, you often hear various people in political discussions, for instance, say, well, everything that's wrong now is wrong because of postmodernism. And what's interesting about that is uh, you, you'll hear people from uh, all across, from the far left to the far right, and including the political center, uh, all say things like that from time to time. They all blame postmodernism. So, uh, so, and we, we, we will talk about the politics of postmodernism, whatever, whatever they might be, uh, in this very lecture. So what is postmodernism? How did it come to have this aura about it of being the thing that uh, is endangering our culture on the one hand, though other people think it's quite exciting and embrace it. Um, and what is it? What? When did it come about? What are its boundaries? And you're going to see it's very hard to tell. Uh, we're going to go through several different theories of what postmodernism is in today's lecture, and you're going to see that they don't necessarily agree with each other or all seem to be describing exactly the same thing. But we're going to look at them anyway. And I do think that when we're talking about the arts, such as literature, we can come up with a, a, a at least a provisional list of some characteristics 
of postmodernism that will allow us to say that any given work is postmodern more than it is something else like modernist or realist. So I do think though, postmodernism in the arts came first to be used in architecture in the 50s. I think, I think that's right. Uh, don't quote me on that. But <laughs> it came to prominence as a discussion in architecture. Architecture critics began to note a shift in the way architecture looked uh, as we entered into the later 20th century. And they, I think, were the first to really put this idea of postmodernism on the map. And appropriately, I think it's easiest to tell the difference between postmodernism and modernism in architecture. Uh, it's easier than in any other type of art. Uh, I actually think the boundaries between modernism and postmodernism in other arts, particularly literature, in fact, are quite blurry and very porous. But architecture, maybe it's just because I haven't studied architecture that closely, <laughs> as closely as I've studied literature, but architecture, it looks very obvious. I've illustrated this on this first slide. So the top slide, uh, and you know, I'm not an architecture critic, so I'm just gonna go through this very quickly. The top slide is a classic modernist building by the famous modernist architect Le Corbusier. And you can see right away that it's very rectilinear, it's very rectangular, the lines are very straight, it's very simple. Um, one of the ways that modernism in architecture is similar to modernism in literature is that there's this idea of the impersonal. The artist doesn't express themselves in either the building or the poem. There's something about it of an impersonal structure. And we see that it's an impersonal structure. It's, I know the picture is black and white, but I think this building is white and gray. Uh, modernism and architecture tended to be about getting rid of adornment, just letting the structure reveal itself. And the structure was these, these planes and squares and, and, and cylindrical objects. It's all very geometrical. Now let's go down to the second picture, which is a postmodern building by a famous postmodern architect named Frank Gehry. And many of you might recognize this building because it's on the University of Minnesota campus. It's the Weissman Art Museum. And instead of an, an unadorned square rectilinear box-like structure that just lays bare the, uh, the, the geometrical patterns that hold it up, which is what modernism in architecture is, this building has this gaudy reflective surface. It has a multitude of chaotic shapes. It has that weird awning that sort of juts off of it. Uh, it looks like a, like a series of like aluminum cans that have been crushed or something. And it's very playful. It's very, uh, it's very chaotic. It's not, it's all over the place. It's personal. The, the architect who did this, you can see uh, Frank Gehry's sensibility in this. It's not about trying to reveal the structure of the building. It's about concealing the structure of the building behind these um, sort of crazy skewed surfaces. Also, it's sort of mirrored. The, the, the surface is sort of mirrored, and that, that idea of the mirror uh, of postmodernism being a matter of sort of reflecting back society to itself. Everything is represented in the postmodern world. We'll talk about that, uh, is something that it comes out in this architecture. But I think if you just look at these two buildings, you see you're obviously dealing with two very different ideas of what art is and what art should be. Um, as hard as it can be to assign works to categories, and as dangerous an idea as that can be in that it reduces the complexity of works of art, I wanted to give you a very clear example of two works that clearly are operating from different ideas of what they should be doing. And also probably because isms don't all coexist at once. You know, one is dominant at one time, and then it gives way to another. These two buildings are obviously informed by different 
historically and socially predominant ideas of what a building should be and of what art should be. So that brings us to the idea of what postmodernism actually is and what it's all about. And instead of giving you a slide that sort of lists its characteristics, um, I'm going to give you three uh, ideas of what it is given by three famous literary and cultural and critical theorists. And as you'll see, they each have a different idea of what it is. But one common denominator uh, uh, that they share, I guess that makes it common, see I'm being redundant, one thing they share is that they all think it's more than just about the art. They all think that postmodernism, unlike some of the things we talked about, like realism, or even modernism, which I think was really in certain ways confined to the arts, postmodernism is about something else. It's about something broader. It's about a condition or a state that has overtaken all of Western society or, or industrial society or post-industrial society at the end of the 20th century. So we're not just talking about an art movement when we're talking about postmodernism, though we are talking about that as well. We're talking about something that informs, I almost said infects, uh, every area of our society. So I seem to be talking around the subject and not talking about it. So let's try to talk about it. I wanna give you three theories of what postmodernism is. The first one, comes from the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard. And he, uh, so I'm over pronouncing the French to be very clear, Lyotard, he wrote the famous book, The Postmodern Condition, a report on knowledge in the 70s. Now the word postmodernism starts to be used as early as the 50s to describe certain trends in the arts, but it really kicks off as something that cultural theorists and critical theorists were writing about in the 70s and 80s. And Lyotard comes out with this very influential book, The Postmodern Condition, A Report on Knowledge, which he was commissioned to write by the Quebecois government in Canada. They asked him to sort of assess the current state, because he was a philosopher and social theorist, the current state of, really, of academic thinking in, a, in an academic and uh, social world that was more and more run by computers, that was more and more computerized. And the, this idea of computers and the digital is a big part of postmodernism. So Leotard writes this report in which he says we're living in a postmodern condition. And the way he defines that is a condition in which our society can no longer believe in certain grand narratives. So here's the way he, what he's thinking about. He says that the modern condition, which goes back again to like the Renaissance and really comes to its, uh, uh, really comes to the fore in the 18th century with the Enlightenment and the American Revolution and the French Revolution, and then the scientific revolutions of the 19th and 20th centuries, everything from Darwin to Einstein. He says the modern world promised us progress. It said that we would make social and technological progress that would liberate us as human beings if we just, um, if we just sort of let scientists and artists and philosophers and political actors go. They would reveal the truth about the world, and with the truth, we could progress into a future of unlimited freedom. Everything from technological progress leading us to the kind of technological wonderlands that people were expecting in the early 20th century. You know, we'd be living in, uh, in, uh, in, in suburban uh, houses behind picket fences on Mars, uh, and where there'd be flying cars and flying buses and all these things. Everything from that technological paradise that was promised us to the revolution's in politics that we were promised, the American Revolution bringing us to a world of unrestricted liberty and prosperity, or the revolution foretold by Karl Marx and attempted in Russia and in China that would bring us to an egalitarian utopia where everyone would uh, would be would be equal to every other person. There would, there would no longer be exploitation. There would no longer be oppression. Um, 
all of these things would uh, were promised us in the Renaissance and in the Enlightenment and in the scientific age up until the middle of the 20th century. And what happens in the middle of 20, the 20th century? World War II, the rise of fascism, the turning of the communist dream into totalitarianism, the revelation that the liberal dream in countries like the United States and Great Britain and France was accompanied with brutal imperialism and racism, the realization that our technological progress has only degraded and destroyed the environment. So progress in the middle of the 20th century comes to a crashing halt. We can no longer believe these grand narratives, whether uh, whether they are the scientific progress, liberal freedom, Marxist revolution, all of these things, we, we can't have any faith in them. They've revealed themselves to be ethically and even pragmatically invalid. Therefore, in the postmodern condition, we must be skeptical of all claims to universal truth, because that's what those revolutionary ideas uh, promised us, which was universal truth. They knew the one right way to be, and we would march into the future behind that banner, and that's how we would be, and now we see that they led us over a cliff. So we must not believe in universal truth claims anymore, and we must focus instead on what's really tr uh, it's true. There's a certain contradiction here. What's, what, <laughs> what is really universally true is that there are no universal truths, and what really the world is made up of is a diversity and plurality of cultures and peoples and of what Leotard, borrowing from an earlier philosopher, calls language games. Leotard says, and a lot of postmodern thinkers emphasize language because what they believe is that each sort of culture, and you can think of that in broad terms, American culture, or you could think of it as in much narrower terms, the culture of lawyers, the culture of doctors, the culture of computer programmers. Any culture is constituted by the language it uses, and it can't really think of anything outside of the languages it speaks, because the limits of your language are the limits of your world. That's what the philosopher Leotard is borrowing from. Wittgenstein famously said, he said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And that's a central postmodern idea that we are, everything we are as individuals is sort of made up of and shaped by the language we speak. And we can't really get out of that to get to some universal truth. We could learn another language. And by language, I both mean literal language, English, French, Japanese, but I also mean the languages of certain um, academic disciplines, the languages of certain subcultures. So we could talk about the language of literary studies versus the language of biology. We could talk about the language of the goth subculture versus the language of the hip hop subculture. But in any case, you are always made up of the languages you speak. And you can't get out of language to universal truth. All the world is made up of is different, what he calls language games. And so all truths, everything that seems to you to be true, is a construct made up of the language of your world. So that is postmodernism according to Leotard. You'll note this isn't really an artistic movement. This is an attempt to describe what the entirety of of Western post-industrial, we'll get to post-industrial in a minute, society has become. It's become a world in which we can no longer believe in grand narratives, we can no longer believe in universal truths, and we know that we are just in, ensconced in and made up of the languages and discourses that frame us at any given moment. So that's one theory of postmodernism. And you'll note, maybe you didn't know this, but <laughs> Leotard seems to think this is basically fine. This is all right. That in fact, grand narratives were immensely destructive. And because they were immensely destructive, we're well to be rid of them. And in fact, there's a kind of ethical need 
to understand the diversity diversity and plurality of the language games that make up the diversity and plurality of the cultures of the world. So Leotard is, I would say, more or less okay with this. It's okay that we live in the postmodern condition. And this is something we're going to see throughout the course. Writers who um, we might call postmodern in that they're describing and also trying to reflect in the way they write this postmodern condition. But we don't necessarily know just from knowing that if they're more or less for it or more or less against it. So we have to keep track of that. Leotard is more or less for it, I would say. Um, then we come to a slightly different way of theorizing some of these same ideas. We come to Frederick Jameson, an American literary theorist. And Frederick Jameson describes, I mean, I think he agrees that a key, a key part of postmodernism is this distrust in grand narratives and this turn to language to explain everything. But he is less <laughs> thrilled about it, number one. And number two, he doesn't think it's actually a shift that just occurred at the level of ideas we have about grand narratives. He thinks that it's about the way our economy changes in the late 20th century that causes us to change our ideas. So Leotard is coming at this from a kind of ideas first perspective. Um, we once believed this, then we saw that these ideas led to bad things, so we changed our ideas. More or less, I'm, I'm not being quite fair to him, but uh, just being oversimplified. Jameson says, actually what comes first is the way our societies are organized, particularly at the economic level, because economics is very important. It's the way our societies create themselves as societies. It's the way we literally reproduce ourselves from day to day by, you know, eating the food that is distributed in certain ways. That's all economics. So Jameson says what happens in the late 20th century is countries like the United States and other post-industrial countries, Western Europe, Japan, etc., move to post-industrial economies where industry moves uh, overseas, where things that used to be manufactured in the United States begin to be outsourced to be manufactured elsewhere, which really starts happening in the late 20th century. Why? Because we move to an idea that um, that it's better for business if they can produce things in places where labor markets are cheaper, and that will reduce costs to consumers. So we move to an economy focused on consumers, and also we move to a society where more and more people are consumers and less and less people are producers because production has been moved elsewhere where labor costs are lower. Note that there's a heavy uh, idea of exploitation here. You're going to go somewhere, you're a, you're a business owner, you're going to move the production part of your business to a place where you can pay the workers less. Um, so as we do this, we move from a society of producers to a, a society of consumers, and we move from a national, more a more national form of capitalism to a more international form of capitalism. Then what happens is we I'm going to put this in, in, you know, all of these writers write in very abstract terms. I'm going to try to put it in very simple terms. What happens is as, as a society, we lose touch with reality because we're literally no longer touching reality anymore. We're no longer a society that uh, that is involved in the labor process to the same extent that we were. So we no longer really have a sense of how our society even came to be what it is. Consumer society is sort of cut off from nature, from history. Uh, why from history? Well, because if you're in consumer society, then the world presents itself to you as a series of choices. And one choice is as good as another. The only difference is perhaps the cost or the quality. But um, let's say, you know, you go, I mean, we can even put this very, uh, very simply. Uh, let's say before the internet, you go to the mall and there, there are no more malls, but the mall was the hallmark of the consumer society. There are still malls, I'm exaggerating. Uh, you go to the mall, you go to a bookstore, and books from all different eras are all on the shelf in front of you. 
and you pick one according to your taste. You no longer sort of have an organic sense of how uh, of the sort of uh, procession, the progress of history. You just sort of see everything as an equivalent choice in front of you, an experience that is totally radicalized and taken to the extreme in the online world. So all all the boundaries that used to exist in society between the old and the new sort of have fallen. And because everything comes to you as an equal matter of choice, also sort of ethical and aesthetic boundaries that used to exist in society. Um, this is true. This is false. This is right. This is wrong. This is good art. This is bad art. This is high art. This is low art. All of those have collapsed because in the mall of consumer society, you can buy anything. And all that matters is what it costs. It doesn't matter if it's right, if it's true, if it's high, if it's low. You're in this timeless present where everything is suspended in the name of your free choice. And so, of course, you can't believe in grand narratives anymore. Jameson agrees with Leotard there. You can't believe in grand narratives of progress because you no longer even have a sense of historical time. You're living simply in the timeless eternity of consumer space where everything is equally available to anyone who can pay and so anything and so you no longer have a sense of history you no longer have a sense of uh, of morality i'm making this very exaggeratedly dystopian to get the point across and you no longer have a sense of yourself as the person who makes the world if you were living in a producer society where it was clear that the people who went to work every day uh like you know you know let's just say like my grandparents they went to a factory every day and they literally made the things that they later saw on the shelf well you knew who made the world you knew who was the agent behind the world you lived in it was it was you it was it was you considered as the producer of your society but in a consumer society you don't make anything you just sort of wait till it comes to you this is in the the late 20th century mall model this doesn't work in the online world where we all produce content as well as consume it that requires a different set of of theorizations which we'll come to later so for jameson uh Postmodernism is the condition of what he calls the late capitalist consumer society. He's a Marxist, so he's using this phrase late capitalist because he anticipates uh, that eventually capitalism will come to an end. Um, so, but he started using this phrase a, a long time ago, and we're still, we're still having capitalism, so uh, it's getting later and later. But nevertheless, uh, the condition of late capitalist consumer society, that's one influential theorization. And then a third influential theorization I want to show you, we go back to a French thinker. This is Jean Baudrillard. And he said that, um, that postmodernism was the age of what he called simulacra. And simulacra is a complicated word, but it means a copy without an original. And he says that in contemporary capitalist society, we are living, and he, so, so Leotard has a very idea-based model. We once believed this, we now believe this. Jameson has an economics-based model. We went from a producer economy to a consumer economy, and that's what changed. Baudrillard is more of a media-focused critic. He says that we have entered such an age of mass media that we live now in a world where everything we experience, we experience through its representation in media. And so media has replaced reality almost entirely because you don't even know who you are in our society until you've sort of been formed and positioned by the media you consume. This is a little bit similar to Leotard's focus on language. Uh, it's language that makes you who you are. In Baudrillard, it's these signs circulating through media that sort of tell you what reality is and who you really are. But you never actually get out to reality. You're completely 
immured, you're walled in, in this media surround of images. And we're so now cut off from reality that the simulacra, we live in an age of simulacra because the media copies, uh, the media signs no longer even refer to some external reality. They just refer to themselves. Um, like one example might be, I sort of saw this in a, in a textbook introducing Baudrillard's idea once, that, you know, you go to college, you're college students, so you went to college, but before you went to college, you consumed a lot of media that said what it would be like and what a college student was and what a college student was like and what the experiences you would have as a college student would be like. And so all of your experiences now are framed and shaped by that media. And Baudrillard says this wasn't always true, and it wasn't always true to the same degree as it is now. You know, people might have gone to college 200 years ago, and they might have read uh, a couple novels, let's say, representing that experience. But it's nothing like being inundated with endless media images on television, in movies, in online media, in fiction, in comic books, in you know, popular music about what that experience is like until there's really no way to tell where your personality ends and the media that shaped it begins. And that's what it means to live in an age of simulacra. And so he also says that that's the primary function of the culture we live in now, to conceal the fact that it's wholly unreal. And it comes up with images of itself that suggest that reality still exists somewhere. And that's the form that the, the sort of media lies take, that they lie to you, that there is still reality. But there's not. Reality's been wholly replaced. And we live wholly in an age of simulacra. His book, Simulacra and Simulation, was extremely influential on the film The Matrix, which is a science fiction movie, you might may, may have seen it from 20 or so years ago, that was very influential, that pictured a dystopian world in which people think they're living an everyday life in the late 20th century, but really it's a delusion created in them by this machine society that keeps them asleep while it sort of feeds on them. And so this is Baudrillard's idea. If you just think of the Matrix, you'll have you'll have a if I mean if you've seen the Matrix, I don't know if people still watch that movie to the same extent. Uh, you'll have Baudrillard's you'll have Baudrillard's idea, and you'll note that Jameson and Baudrillard both give postmodernism the thumbs down. That it's not they don't really allow it to be an ethical recognition of diversity that was previously crushed by things like fascism and imperialism, as we find in Leotard. For them, it is, a, uh, it is really a kind of terrible dystopian prospect of the fatal cutting off of humanity from any sense of, of the real. And so, again, we will have to chart this. We're going to see throughout the next few weeks in the course, not only these two weeks, but in subsequent weeks when we talk about the liberation movements that come out of the 60s, um, both the, the, the problems with living in a postmodern society, but also the things it makes available to us ethically as people. So these are all things to keep in mind. These are ways in which we can define what it is to live in a postmodern society versus a modern one that arguably all of these, um, well, Jameson and Baudrillard would say a modern society maybe had more touch with reality. Uh, Leotard would actually say was more deluded by believing in these prior grand narratives. But in either case, um, there's a difference. And so, uh, and, and let's go, let's look at back at the image on the first slide now with these ideas in mind. So the modern idea that we see embodied in this first piece of architecture by Le Corbusier, by Le Corbusier is that 
uh, architecture can reveal the truth about itself if it creates simple and unadorned buildings. That's very similar to the grand narrative proposed by Leotard, that we're getting closer and closer to scientific truth, to the realization of the good society, and in Le Corbusier we're getting closer and closer to the realization of what a true architecture is, as opposed to a false architecture that is full of um, adornments that conceal what the building is actually made of. So Gary at the bottom, Frank Gary, throws that out and says, hey, we can't believe in these grand narratives. We can't believe in this universal truth of what a building should be. A, uni a building should be plural and diverse and kind of what I want it to be. And so we can apply these ideas uh, we, the, to these buildings. We can see how the way that Leotard theorizes postmodernism can be applied to these buildings. And then similarly with Jameson and Baudrillard, well, Le Corbusier's building being made, being uh, displaying in an, in an unornamented way the materials that it's made out of, doesn't that show a society in much greater contact with the realities of how it is produced and how it produces itself. Here's the concrete, you know, no lie, no lie here. Whereas Gary says, you know, my building is another set of, uh, of reflected images in which you can see yourself in a world of freely circulating images. And uh, whether you like it or not is up to you, and I'm not making any claims that anything is true or false. Here's just another representation. And because the surface is mirrored, it is ultimately just another representation of yourself. So that's how we can apply these ideas to works. I know this has been a long digression. This is not a course in architecture, nor am I qualified to teach a course in architecture. I've never even taken a course in architecture. I've just walked around and looked at buildings. Um, and I didn't ask you to read any of these texts, but to understand what postmodernism is and how that informs the works we're going to read, I thought I had to do a certain amount of laying of groundwork. And the works that I asked you to read this week, the postmodern manifestos in the Norton Anthology of American Literature, didn't really explain it very well. And so I, I, I do want to talk about some of those manifestos, but not all at once. I want to talk about one of them this week, Frank O'Hara's Personism, which was a his sort of explanation of what his poetry is all about. And then I want to look at William H. Gass's medium of fiction next week when we talk about fiction. And then I want to look at Audre Lorde's Poetry is Not a Luxury in two weeks when we talk about postmodernism's relation to the literature of the social movements and the liberation movements of the 60s. So I do want to talk about some of those manifestos. Other of them were kind of too short to do anything with, so um, so I'm going to neglect some of them. So we're going to talk about O'Hara this week, Gas next week, and Lord in two weeks. So I want you to keep those in mind. Um, the main thing today, or the main thing this week that I want to focus on is the postmodern poetry of Frank O'Hara and John Ashbery. And then I want to get next week into the postmodern fiction of Thomas Pynchon, Philip K. Dick, and other writers. So in order to look at postmodern literature, we have to have a sense of what some of the characteristics of postmodern literature are. And I have two slides for this. These will be the final two slides of this lecture. The main word that's usually applied to postmodernism in literature and the other arts is irony. Irony is usually said to be the hallmark of postmodernism. And I'm going to explain why and how that works and what that has to do with what we were just talking about. But before I do, you also have to have a, just a definition of irony in general. So I would define irony in general, particularly in literature, the following way. Irony in, occurs when there's some gap between what you think is happening and what's really happening. So that's the biggest, broadest definition I can give you of irony. The gap between what you expect or what you believe and what's actually real. And that happens in literature in, tr in traditionally three different ways. There's three different types of irony generally in literature. And this is a very common idea. You probably actually learned this in your high school English class. So I'm going to go through it 
pretty quickly. So the three types of irony in literature are verbal irony, which is when an author or character says one thing and means another. This is very similar in everyday life to sarcasm. Uh, you know, just think of a sarcastic reply, like, um, um, you're really having a bad day. It's obvious you're having a bad day. You were caught in the rain. You're all wet. Um, you're, uh, you, you dropped your, uh, your bag in the, in the water and all your books are wet and you're visibly distressed and you say, yeah, I'm having a great day. That's verbal irony. Now notice verbal irony to work requires on requires the person listening to you knowing what's true uh, the person listening to you knows and can see that you're having a bad day so verbal irony requires the person hearing it to know what's really being said so that's verbal irony dramatic irony is as the name implies this was devised to discuss plays and we can also use it to discuss movies. It's when the reader knows more than the characters. And the classic example is in a horror movie where there's a killer in the basement and you know, you have been shown by the filmmaker that there's a killer in the basement. And then you also see that the uh, character, the hero, the heroine of the movie is gonna go down to the basement and she's opening the door and she doesn't know there's a killer down there but you know because you've already seen it and you're thinking no don't go in the basement that's dramatic irony it was originally discussed to uh, it was originally sort of coined to talk about ancient Greek tragedies where these were plays that uh, that dramatized classic myths and the audience knew the mythical stories so the characters were acting out a story the audience already knew and the audience is sitting there kind of like wincing because the characters don't know what they're getting into you know no oedipus that's your mother etc a little in joke for those who know greek tragedy um but note dramatic irony also requires the audience to know what's true you know what's really going on, even though the characters don't. And then the final type of irony often spoken of in literature is situational irony. That's when the opposite of what is expected occurs. That is when there's some outcome <clears throat> that's very different from what you might have been led to expect by the way the situation was set up. And notice that this too requires the audience to know the truth, which is what a fitting outcome would be. All three forms of traditional irony in literature require the audience to have a stable sense of truth. What's really being said for verbal irony, what's really going on for dramatic irony, and what a fitting or proper outcome would be for situational irony. And there's irony all throughout literature from the very beginning, going back to ancient Greece, there's irony in literature. So why is irony considered the hallmark of postmodern literature? Because of the special way that irony is used in postmodern literature. Postmodern literature gets rid of that expectation of truth that traditional irony relies on. Traditional irony relies the audience to have a knowledge of what's true so they can see how irony is sort of, um, min let, me, let me put it this way. Traditional irony emphasizes the truth by swerving away from it. It emphasizes the truth of what's being said by having somebody say something different. It emphasizes the sort of moral truth of what a good outcome would be by showing you a bad outcome. Uh, traditional irony relies on a stable sense of truth and highlights truth. Postmodern irony in works of art and literature create a pervasive sense that nothing is true or reliable, that everything is an artificial construction or simulation of truth and that nothing can possibly be taken seriously. That's how postmodern irony 
differs from traditional irony. Um, it's as if you said, yeah, I'm having a great day, and there was no indication in any way that you didn't mean it or that you did. It simply becomes blankly impossible to tell what's true. It becomes impossible to know what's really going on in a literary work. It becomes impossible to know what the author wants you to think a happy ending would be um, by disappointing you with a sad ending. All these sort of signposts to truth that traditional irony set up are taken down and you're left in a world just of sort of suspended uh, suspended belief. You don't know what's true or false. And now that I've said that, isn't it clear what that has to do with the theorizations of postmodernism we've heard from Lyotard and Baudrillard and Jameson? That it's impossible to tell what's true in a consumer society cut off from what's real. If you don't know what's real, you can't know what's true. And if you are in a consumer society where everything presents itself to you as a matter of your choice, well then what's good or bad or high or low or proper or improper or true and false no longer really matter. It's just, you know, can I afford it? Do I like it? And so all truth is suspended in this postmodern world. So that, that sense, if you encounter a work of literature where you can't tell what's right or wrong, what's true or false, or even, as you'll see in John Ashbery, even what's being said at all, then, uh, then you're in a world of postmodern irony. And I would contrast this with the works we've read up to this point, even the difficult ones. You know, Howl by Allen Ginsberg is not a, an easy poem to understand. There's lines that don't make any clear sense. But by the end of that poem, you know what he's for and he's against. He's against Moloch, which is this force of the, you know, sort of modern um, rationality that's destroying his world. And he's for him and his friends who are seeking out visionary experiences that somehow are in excess of that Moloch rationality. When you read John Ashbery's Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, written 20 years later, uh, it's not even clear what's being said in some of those lines, let alone what the poet is for or against. We're going to do our best. I'm going to do my best, but it's not clear at all what's even happening. And so that poem, I think, is written under the the sign of modern, of postmodern irony, whereas Ginsburg still believes in a grand narrative. Moloch is bad. Me and my friends are good. If we get our way, we'll live in a better society. Uh, and I don't think Ashbery, you could make the same claims. So that, that sense of nothing is true, nothing is reliable, nothing is real, nothing is serious, everything's kind of a joke, uh, that is the postmodern irony that we will see in so much postmodern literature. And I want to end this lecture with just a few more characteristics of postmodern literature to look out for. Um, all of them sort of add up to that sense of irony. So the first one that I want to look at on this slide is what's called pastiche. Pastiche, and you could, that's a, this is a French word, but you can almost sort of see the English word paste in it, you know? And a pastiche is when a work of art borrows words, images, metaphors, allusions, genres uh, from different domains and combines them in an incongruous way. And what do I mean by that? I mean, um, we're going to see next week when we read Thomas Pynchon, this is a characteristic of his fiction, that he will write fiction that alludes to classical myth and sort of religious iconography and Christian iconography on the one hand, and then he also alludes to um, to popular culture, to sort of, uh, sort of ephemeral TV shows and comic books, and he sort of takes all of these things and the tones that go with them, the sort of jokey tone of television sitcoms, 
and the visionary tone of Christian iconography and puts them into one work. So the work no longer has a uniform style or a uniform tone. It's kind of all over the place because it's a paste up of these different elements, just as in postmodern society, you're living in a consumer culture where you're being bombarded equally by signs and images from so many different domains. So pastiche is one. Related to pastiche is what I call the high-low combo. So <laughs> I try to make that sound like a, uh, a fast food uh, value meal or something. But the idea is that <clears throat> in the early 20th century or in the 19th century or in the 18th century, there was a much more stable sense of a hierarchy in the art. That certain forms of art were high art, and you had to be to know them to be educated and if you didn't know them you weren't educated um you know poetry is more serious than fiction which is more serious than visual media and uh and and this kind of music is more serious than that kind of music uh basically music you can't dance to is more serious than music you can dance to etc all of these hierarchies collapse in the 20th century. And this is one of those moments where you can see what leotard means by there being this ethical quality to postmodernism. Because all those previous hierarchies were based, among other things, though they did have an inner logic, but they were based on class. The upper class listened to this, the lower class listens to that, so this is better than that. And with this collapse in a hierarchy, it's a collapse in a social hierarchy. Um, it's a more egalitarian society when those, um, when those distinctions collapse. So cultural elements once seen divided into high culture, myth, religion, literature, and low culture, movies, pop music, comic books, etc. When these things get put together in one work, or when... A, a work of so-called high literature sort of is referencing all these low things, or when a work of so-called low literature gets discussed as if it were completely uh, serious and important, that's a postmodern element. And here, I think, is where you can see not a dystopian element of postmodernism, but a utopian element, a, a sort of classless world of the arts. That is, a world without classes in the art. So the destruction of high and low boundaries in culture. All forms of culture become equal. An opera, a myth, a comic book, a TV sitcom, a tweet, etc. all become, uh, you know, equalized on the same plane because they all exist in that plane of consumer culture. Next element is metafiction. Meta is when it's it's any time the the work of art reminds the reader that the text is a fictional construct or artifice that is not a representation of real life but is just a made up form. And that goes back to again to that leotard idea of language games. In leotard's world um a, a work of art that didn't signal to you from time to time that it was a work of art uh, would be trying to fool you into believing in a grand narrative. It would try to t pass off its narrative as a real one. And yet we've most of the works we've read this semester so far have not been metafictional. They have just sort of posed straightforwardly as stories about things that quote-unquote really happened and they never sort of announce to you that they are artificial. Um, one exception might be Elizabeth Bishop's Questions of Travel, but I explicitly positioned that as a poem, which by asking itself all of these questions about itself as a poem about travel was sort of a poem that moves from the modern to the postmodern. And we're going to see a big difference when we get, I think, to particularly to fiction. Uh, the sort of metafictional tricks played by a Thomas Pynchon are very different from a writer like James Baldwin who expects you to take his stories perfectly seriously as things that might really happen that tell you moral truths. Whereas Pynchon is saying, no, you know, none of this really happened, uh, bear that in mind. And that could, that could be cynical, you know, none of this really happened, it's all a joke. Uh, we sometimes get that in things like Frank O'Hara's poetry, 
but it can also be ethically serious on its own that any work that didn't announce itself as fictional is trying to fool you into believing that its narrative is true when we in the postmodern world know that there are no true narratives and anything that calls itself a true narrative will just end up oppressing somebody as leotard showed with all the uh, progressive narratives of modernity that ended in the in the catastrophes of the mid 20th century so metafiction can be a cynical joke but it can also be an ethical priority uh, of an author who doesn't want to to doesn't want to somehow trick you doesn't want to somehow um lie to you and then finally this is a term i borrowed directly from frederick jameson the uh postmodern art and literature is characterized by a waning of affect affect means emotion and it's easy to see why this happens why works of art become so much less emotional again i'd ask you to compare the passion of Ginsburg's howl to the sort of seeming affectlessness or blasé quality, except for one moment when he cries. We'll talk about that. But the blasé quality of John Ashbery's self-portrait in a convex mirror, the almost raving visionary tones of Ginsburg as against the sort of baffled, uh, calm and sort of sly irony and wit of Ashbery. So artistic styles become cool, detached, cynical, devoid of strong feeling. Why? Obviously, if your work is just a construct, you're constantly telling your reader that your work is just a construct. If you don't feel that you have anything true or real to convey, well, then there's no uh, reason to get excited, is there? Uh, there's no reason to to uh to take on the prophetic tones of these are very different types of prophetic tones but the prophetic tones of an allen ginsburg or a james baldwin uh you can't you you don't you don't have the right to them anymore you don't have the right to those tones because you're not conveying anything true or real except perhaps the truth of a world where truth is no longer possible and the reality of a world in which the real is no longer accessible so that is my first attempt to explain postmodernism. It's very complicated. Note again, finally, it's not solely a movement in the arts. It's a kind of, um, it's a kind of general state of society in, let's say, the fifties and after. And artists respond to it in various ways. Some by taking on the characteristics of the postmodern condition, some by resisting them, and some by a combination thereof. And that's what we're going to talk about next. This, again, this week, postmodern poetry. So I want to move on now in subsequent lectures to Frank O'Hara and to John Ashbery, and then we'll move on to fiction later. So thanks very much, and have a great day.